welcome back to my channel. So as I said in my previous video, Wednesday videos for the month of February are just going to be a random collection of all the different mini series topics. So I figured the first video that I would do in the month of February would be a Jane and a John Doe. I asked you guys on social media to suggest a Jane or a John Doe that you would specifically like to see today, and I got quite a few requests for the Sumter County Does. And when I started researching into it a little bit, I became so incredibly fascinated with the case because it's in my area, kind of, and I'm surprised I've never heard of them before. On August 9th, 1976, the body of a male and the body of a female was found dumped on a side road in Sumter County, South Carolina on a dirt road that was right off of I-95. And the road pretty much was nothing. I've looked at it now. I don't even see houses off of this road. Kind of just seems like a country cut through. But a truck driver happened to be driving by that morning around 6.30 in the morning to take a rest. Again, since there's nothing really off of this road, truck drivers would pull over, get a couple hours of sleep on it, wouldn't be bothered. But unfortunately, sleep was not in his cars because instead he stumbled upon a horrific murder scene. Authorities soon after arrived on the scene and it was pretty apparent that it was in fact a homicide without them having to do much research because of the state the bodies were found in. Both bodies appear to have been shot execution style. The male and the female both had three bullets enter their body, one through their back, one through their chest, and one through their throat. A witness came forward and this part I find very, very interesting but someone nearby apparently heard this commotion happen. They claimed that they heard a car drive down the dirt road. If you've ever heard a car driving down a dirt road before, you can hear it from a very, very far distance, so maybe this isn't that far-fetched. They heard the car drive down the dirt road, heard the door open, heard some shots, and then immediately, like within seconds, the door slammed back shut and the car sped off back towards the highway. I can't find a lot about this story, but I find quite a few things strange with it. The fact that someone managed to hear this, but from what I've seen, there aren't many houses in the area. Granted, if something could have been very different back when this happened. I also find it strange that this person never called the police to begin with, especially since these people were shot six times total. That would be very alarming for me. Maybe it wasn't in the area. Um, I don't know if hunting maybe was something that happened frequently there, but the male found at the scene later on went to be named Jock Doe, which I will explain in a little bit, and he was thought to be between the ages of 18 and 30 years old. There was a lot of confusion at first. A lot of people thought he was between 18 and I want to say 22, uh, but then a dentist looked at things and said, no, he has to be older than 27. So honestly, a lot of people were very unsure about it. He had shoulder length, wavy brown hair, brown eyes, and some pretty distinctive bushier brown eyebrows and he had quite a strong build as if he had played sports at one point in his life. He was over six feet tall and weighed about 150 pounds. But there were quite a few things that really set him apart and police honestly thought this was going to take them straight to the answer of who this man was since no one seemed to be coming and claiming them. This man had a lot of dental work done. I'm talking an extensive amount. And a lot of the procedures that were done were not very common to the US. So this led them to believe that he was from a different country or at least traveled to a different country to have some of this dental work done. Because of this, they also were led to the conclusion that he might have been very wealthy, part of a wealthy family or wealthy himself, they couldn't say, but traveling very far for very expensive dental work wasn't the most common thing Thing unless you had a lot of money. Part of his dental work also included a very unique root canal. I think there were only 13 dentists in all of the United States that had ever performed this when this all happened. He also appeared to be in the middle of getting complete restoration of all of his teeth, which again wasn't the most common thing at the time, so someone had to have known who it was. Someone had to have remembered doing all of this insane work on this man. He had a four inch long appendectomy scar and he also had a few small scars on his back and around his body which went hand in hand with the thought that he played sports, maybe contact sports such as football, and he was wearing Levi jeans and a red shirt that read, Pours America's Light Beer on the Front, 
And Camel Challenger GT Sebring 75 with a Snoopy logo on the back. And this is a shirt for a very particular car race that happened, I think, in Florida at the time. And you could only buy these shirts at the venue. So again, they were like, okay, we nailed it. He's from Florida. Except things kept getting more confusing. He had a pack of Grant's Truck Shop matches in his pocket, and this led them to the Midwestern portion of the United States, which is an incredibly different area than Florida. These truck stops in particular were found in Idaho, Arizona, Nebraska, so again, placing him in a completely different area across the country. He wore a yellow gold Bulova watch, and I don't know if I pronounced that right. Pal tried to teach me before this, but I think it's Bulova is the name of the brand. It was incredibly, an incredibly nice and expensive watch. And he also wore a 14 karat gold ring with a gray star sapphire. Again, another expensive item. Inside of the ring was something that kind of excited everyone. It was the initials JPF. So he had a lot of things on him that you would think would help identify him. He had initials that were possibly his own or someone that he loved on his ring. He he had a nice watch that usually comes with serial numbers, a shirt explaining somewhere he had possibly been just months before, but unfortunately none of this ended up helping them in the long run. The female with him was definitely a lot younger than he was, not by an extreme amount, but she was definitely quite a few years younger. She was thought to be between the ages of 18 and 25 as the absolute oldest. She was five foot five and weighed somewhere between 100 and 105 pounds. Her skin tone and her build were incredibly similar to Jock Doe. So at first they guessed that they might be related, possibly siblings. However, that was later dismissed through a DNA test. She had reddish brown shoulder length hair that was a pretty wavy and she had bluish green eyes however there are some people out there who argue that they were actually hazel she had some pretty distinguishing features as well first of all she was known to be absolutely beautiful and she had unnaturally long eyelashes. She also had two moles on the left side of her face right by her mouth. She was well groomed just like the male. It appeared as if they had both recently showered and taken care of themselves. She also had dental work done. It was nowhere near as significant. She only had fillings in all of the back of her teeth and she had two of her wisdom teeth removed. But other than that, there weren't really any other distinguishing features on her body. She had no scars, there wasn't any tattoos, nothing that really set her apart. She was wearing a muslin blouse, like a flowy blouse, over a front tying halter top. And she was wearing a pink and lavender, like slip on wedge sandals, and a floral print scarf tied around her waist as a belt. She also wore jewelry that was very unique. It was thought to be handmade Native American jewelry or Mexican jewelry that they believe that she purchased somewhere in the Southwest. And all of it was made of sterling silver. She had three rings in total. One ring had a black oblong stone with small turquoise chips embedded in it. The second had a scrolling feather shape with coral and turquoise stones. And the third was just a simple band with some white and blue stones. They found that both Jock and Jane Doe had been murdered within the past 24 hours of finding them. Them. There were no drugs in their system, there was no alcohol in their system, and there was no form of identification or anything at all in their pockets. They had nothing on them except for the clothes they were wearing and their jewelry, which was very strange to investigators because if you find no identification, if you find nothing, you kind of assume it was a robbery. Maybe their wallets were taken, maybe her purse was taken in hopes of finding money, but all of the very, very expensive jewelry that was on them wasn't taken. So that led them to believe there was some other motive. No one came forward to claim them at all and they had really no significant leads considering they were placed in South Carolina, Florida, possibly three other states in the Midwest. So they started putting all of the most significant features of them all over the place in hopes that someone might recognize it. They took their fingerprints, they took their dental records, the males in specific, and put it in different magazines. But unfortunately, I think they put the dental records in the magazine upside down, which made it very difficult to determine, I guess what was going on. There were some symbols in there that weren't used widely by dentists anymore. A lot of people think that that stopped any dentist who did the work from identifying them, but 
despite it being upside down, I feel like those are kind of procedures that you would know well enough to know if like, oh, I didn't do that on the top, I did that on the bottom. Or you know what I'm saying? Something vice versa. So to me, I think the best thing that says is that they were right in the fact that this work didn't happen in the US because these magazines probably were only distributed in the US. Then a man came forward a few months later claiming that he had a conversation with the male at a KOA campsite near Santee, South Carolina, which was about 40 minutes away from where the murder occurred. Now I don't have a direct time this happened, I don't have a direct location. Stories here are very, very muddled and a lot of the information I feel like was kind of overlooked in the case. But this employee said that the male and the female had been staying at the campsite. I've seen times from five months to possibly just a couple of days that they were staying there. This employee befriended Jock Doe while playing pool one night and Jock kind of came forward about a couple of things. So this is where the name Jock Doe comes from. This man claimed to be from Canada. He said he had a very well-known father that was a doctor. He claimed that he ran away with his girlfriend because he didn't want to become a doctor and his father was pressuring it a lot. So they were just taking a vacation of sorts around the United States. And he also told the man that his name was either Jock or Jacques. Um, Jacques is a very French name and as you guys I'm sure hopefully know, there is a huge French population in Canada. So that being said, at this point, when you take the ring having a J on it, when you take this sighting and the fact that he might not have been from the US from his dental records, they pretty much gathered the idea that he was more than likely from Canada like he said and the sighting was true everything matched up. Jock told this man that him and his female companion were going to go down to Florida. Now again, I've seen different versions of this where they went down, but then they came back up and claimed to say they liked it better there than in Florida. I've seen some people say that they went down there for the race that was on his shirt and that's where he got that shirt, but the race would have been months before all of this happened. I've seen like a bunch of conflicting information on this, so I wanted to let you guys know all of the different versions that I've seen instead of just choosing one because I honestly don't know which one is the truth. This man also said that before leaving, Jock tried to pawn off his ring that we talked about earlier. This man didn't want to pay for it, didn't want to buy it, but that also leads us to believe that he was kind of trying to gather some funds, gather some money to travel more places, which would make the whole backpack packing, uh, driving through America for fun, or of a possible theory. The contents of their stomach were looked into next. They'd either eaten fruit or had fruit ice cream. They couldn't really determine which. So they started looking at local stores, local fruit stands, ice cream shops, and sure enough, there was a fruit stand right off of the Florence Highway, which was just a little bit north of where they were found. This person swears up and down that they saw them. And then another tip came in. There was a man from Nebraska, which would make sense with the matches that were found, that said that there was a couple matching their description completely. Came to a shop and had him work on their car and their car either had Washington or Oregon license plates. Now again this makes sense because if they came from Canada, especially if they were on the west side of Canada, they would have come down and the first place they would have come to would have been Washington or Oregon. However despite all of this I don't think anything was actually confirmed and again no one was coming to claim them. No one knew why. This didn't make sense. They seemed to be young adults but well off, which meant there had to have been a family out there somewhere who had been taking care of them, who was looking for them, but no one was coming forward. Then in December of 1976, a man from Wadesboro, North Carolina was arrested in South Carolina for driving under the influence. They searched his car, they found a gun. The weapon from the crime had been a 357 revolver, and interestingly enough, so was the gun that was found in Lonnie's car. And to make matters even more bizarre, the serial number had in fact been scratched off. Because of this, they decided to test that evidence against each other, and they found out that they had the murder weapon. So they really started thinking Lonnie was their most possible suspect. He was in the area, he was not very far when he was found. Wadesboro, North Carolina was around, I think, one and a half to two hours away from where the bodies were found. So they started questioning him over and over again, intense interrogations, they did a couple of polygraphs, but none of the information was ever really conclusive and every single thing showed a different outcome. So it was very contradicting. Um, they couldn't really nail 
nail anything significant down and prove it. And he was able to come up with an alibi as well. He claimed his wife was in the hospital at the time these murders were committed. He said that he was in the hospital by his wife and I guess that was good enough for the police officers. I don't know if there was ever actually any proof, if there was any paperwork. You would think from a hospital, most of the time you have to sign in as a guest and if that was what happened, did they have record of it? But that didn't change the fact that he somehow was in possession of the murder weapon. So they started asking more about the gun and he claimed he actually got this gun from his brother a few years earlier, which means he basically just admitted to having the gun for years before this even happened. He said his brother Jim Henry had given him the gun as a gift. However, Jim Henry also was in possession of essentially a stolen gun. They realized that in 1974, just a few years before this, the gun had been stolen from the Raleigh-Durham area in North Carolina by a bunch of thieves. So. You know, the gun did have an original owner, but then it was stolen, and then somehow Jim Henry got it, and then for some unknown reason, Jim Henry wanted to throw it off on his brother. I don't know if Jim Henry was involved in stealing it, or maybe stole it to commit a crime and then pawned it off on his brother. There was a whole bunch of people who for sure knew it was him. He claimed that no one would have had access to the gun, that no one had access to his home. But guns don't just get up and walk away for a couple of hours to go shoot two people three times each. So while it seems very unbelievable, somehow the alibis checked out to the police and he was released. And I personally think they overlooked the man that murdered these two individuals. The couple was kept at a local funeral home. Uh, they were kept out for viewing as well and there were tons of parents looking for their young children, completely in distress only to realize this wasn't their loved one and the same thing just happened again and again. Nobody was able to successfully identify Jock and Jane Doe. On August 14th, 1977, just a little over a year from when the murder occurred, they finally had to bury the two bodies because of deterioration and they're buried in Bethel United Methodist Church in Oswego, South Carolina. Verna Moore, the Sumter County coroner, worked on this case nonstop. This was something that she was unable to let go of. She refused to believe they couldn't catch someone or figure out who these two individuals were. So she literally worked until she retired in 2008. It feels like there were a lot of times police really, really dropped the ball. According to what I've seen, the people who owned the campsite kept extensive records. I've seen claims that they even went as far as taking pictures of their different guests, which means that there is a high possibility names, pictures, addresses, telephone numbers, all of that information was at this campsite from Jock and Jane Doe and somehow police never got to it. I've also seen claims that all of this information was lost in a fire eventually, so there is no way ever of really knowing. People don't know why they released Lonnie so fast and just completely let him off the hook. You know, if you're found with a murder weapon and you claim you've had it for years and have no explanation how it magically disappeared when no one has access to your home and you magically have it back again. I just think that's absolutely insane that they just let this man go. That makes no sense whatsoever. Now we're going to go ahead and get into the theories. There are an insane, insane amount of theories online. You guys, I went through I don't even know how many threads on web sleuths of, you know, people thinking of brilliant ideas and rolling things out and getting more information and doing comparisons on the Doe Network. I mean, it is absolutely insane and I highly suggest if you're really interested in this case to go check out all of the web sleuths threads because they are doing work. I was redirected to like 7 million different threads. but. Because of that, I'm also having to really narrow down the theories. There are theories that they were killed while hitchhiking. There are theories that they were killed by hitchhikers. Um, they did seem to have a car. There's reports of them having a motorcycle as well. And if that's true, I don't really picture them you know, hitchhiking anywhere. If they had their own vehicle, then I think it's a lot more likely that they picked up a hitchhiker and that hitchhiker decided they were just gonna kill them and take their car. But then there's one huge theory that a lot of people really seem to believe and I 
don't know how to feel about it. Many people believe they were involved in drug smuggling and organized crime. The way they were killed was execution style and shockingly similar to when the mafia orders hits on people, which means that they were more than likely specifically targeted. And normally that doesn't happen unless you know you know something you're not supposed to, you were involved in something, and they don't want you to be around anymore. Um, and that's what leads a lot of people to believe this particular theory. This theory was validated even more later on when they realized that the race teams represented on his shirt were later found out to be heavily involved in huge, I'm talking huge drug smuggling operations. They had connections to the government, their allegations that they had connections to the CIA. It's absolutely insane. But if he was wearing that shirt, he could possibly be linked to those race teams, which were eventually linked to drug smuggling. So I see it as a possibility. On top of all those possibilities, the town they were found in was widely known for corruption at that time period. Many, many politicians and high up businessmen were accused of multiple murder for hire situations. Just a few months before and not too far away, there was a police chief that was murdered by another officer. There was a whole bunch of corruption and manipulation and government agencies involved in overseeing illegal activity. But what I will say is a lot of the evidence and information that was found, especially the gun, was immediately sent to, I'm pretty sure, a federal investigator. So because of where the location was and where specific things were found, there were multiple counties involved. Um, and even the federal government. So that would mean everyone would somehow have to be involved in it. Now, that's definitely likely. I'm not saying that's not a likely theory, but because so many different counties and agencies were involved, it's not as likely that they're all in on the same thing, if you get what I'm trying to say. My particular hang up on this theory is that drug smugglers usually have a decent amount of money. Now, again, Sometimes they don't, sometimes they lose it, and sometimes they spend it all. But he was trying to pawn his ring, which to me says that they were in a pretty desperate need for money if they were starting to pawn off some of the only items they might have had. Also, they weren't found with drugs in their system, and while it is completely possible to sell drugs and smuggle drugs without actually using them. Maybe they were young backpackers just traveling around the United States and they realized the easiest way for money was to have some illegal wild mafia fun and drug cartel fun. I know it's good money fast, it's definitely illegal and crazy work, but some of the things that I feel like do support this is again the fact that they were killed execution style. They had absolutely no identification on their bodies, almost like this person who did it knew that they were foreign and knew that no one in the US would know them. Um, so they took whatever possible bits of identification away. There was no fear by whoever did it of being caught. There was no fear that these people would be identified and linked to anyone. So that to me does strongly support the drug operation, but I don't know, something about it, I don't know, his shirt could have been bought at Goodwill somewhere. You don't, you don't really know. There are a few people on web sleuths that said there was um, a hurricane, I think at the time, which means a lot of people were being evacuated from the Carolina coastline. That being said, there would be a lot of people at these campsites probably trying to find somewhere to stay until they can go home. I'm sure hotels and everything like that booked up incredibly fast. So what's the next best bet? A campsite. So maybe they just met the wrong person. And again, that person could have been from out of town. But you have to keep in mind in the back of your head and all of these theories, how would this person have received the gun? How would this person have taken the gun from Lonnie and then managed to give it back? Either Lonnie or someone related to him or close to him has to be the person that committed this crime. He himself admitted that he had had the gun for years. He was in possession of the gun 
when these people were brutally murdered. The few things you're going to do with a stolen gun are going to be sell it or use it to commit a crime so it can't be traced back to you. Granted, you could just want one, but those are usually the two main reasons that you steal a gun. I find it interesting that right after the gun was stolen, somehow Jim received the gun? Did he get it from a pawn shop? Like, what happened there? Like, how did he become in possession of the gun? And at that point, he had to have known it was stolen, so why would he give it to his brother? I don't know. It's just so strange to me. And on top of that, you don't lend your gun to someone, whether it is stolen or not, and then take it back. You're very careful with your guns. It can be traced back to you. Even if it was a stolen gun and he lent it out to someone, if he took it back, there is still a possibility that if he's found with it on him, something like this can happen where it can be linked to a crime. You have to really not be thinking to just lend your gun out to someone. I don't know if he claimed that's what happened or, you know, he just claims this gun miraculously grew legs and went and killed two people. But I feel like everyone's digging so deep into this mystery when the answer is right in front of them. I feel like this is just one of those things that people have tried to look so deep into and like make these crazy connections but I personally believe Lonnie murdered this couple. I honestly do. I don't know, let me know what you guys think down below. Do you think people are kind of picking this story way too far apart and trying to make it something much more intense? You know, I, I personally think his name is Jacques or Jock, or even maybe Jack. Um, he had dental work done, extensive dental work it would make sense if his father was a doctor or maybe a huge dentist or dental surgeon. A J was found on the ring. If his father was a doctor of some sort, it explains the fact that he grew up with a lot of money and had a lot of expensive items on him. I feel like it's just a very obvious thing. But again, maybe I'm just thinking too simply about it. So did these two young adults run away from Canada and end up at the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't know what the motive would have been for Lonnie. He said he was a truck driver at some point, so maybe he knew this area as well. Why would he have traveled so far away from his wife who was in the hospital? It's like every theory kind of makes sense, but then there's so many things that just point to it being absolutely insane. So I wanna know what you guys think down below. What theory do you think is the most likely? Do you have your own theory? And on that note, I'm gonna go ahead and go guys. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up button and hit the subscribe button to become a member of the family and I'll see you in my next video.